I die, he laughed. And then he disappeared. Anyway, end of story. So that actually, that passage actually tells a lot about Foucault and Foucault's life. He, he was gay, and he did spend a lot of time in San Francisco, in the bathhouses. He did, um, and uh, there, are, there are accounts in the book of his indulgences and his engagements with sadomasochist sexuality, his experimentation with LSD in Death Valley. He, Foucault, believed in that power was ubiquitous, was ever, we were intimately engaged in structures of power. Power was inescapable, and therefore, though he never talked about it in his books, therefore we should struggle always. We should, we should always be experimenting at the liminalities, experimenting in new ways, trying to build up a sort of sense of freedom by struggling against power. But never talk about those struggles. Always write about the power, the power of institutions. And that's what the discipline and punish is all about. Yeah. So, that's where I was going to end, but I guess that's where I'm going to have to now tell you a little bit about Foucault and his background, his philosophical background. I said a little bit about his personal background. Um, he, by the way, to end this, he, his, his, all his writings were actually focused very much on, not, not his writings, well, implicitly his writings, but his, his, his philosophical thinking and his engagements, as you can see even from that encounter, were very much focused on the ideas of death. For him, death was somehow an escape from power. So experimenting on the liminalities of these institutions, experimenting with different drugs and with different forms of sexuality, was for him, and the really, even, even, even the, 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 the possibility of getting AIDS was something that sort of, for him, captured the idea of a struggle against power, captured the idea of freedom. And in the end, he did die, and it is always assumed that he died of AIDS. Um, so, I think you have to bear in mind that background when you actually read Foucault. He doesn't explicate it, obviously, but it is very much informed. He is, because of his identity as a gay homosexual in France in the 1970s and 80s, he is incredibly sensitive to the power that surrounds him. His analysis of power is actually, in some ways, some ways reminiscent of Durkheim. He writes books like, he basically argues, he basically argues that different periods of history are marked, are marked by different so-called deviants. So, he writes a book called Madness and Civilization, a very famous book, in which I think the fundamental idea is that in an era, in an age of rationality and reason, it is the mad person who is deviant. And by actually focusing on that deviant, the mad person, one does what? One focuses, one, one thematizes, one brings to the surface the character of that society. One knows a society by who is stigmatized, who is constituted as deviant. And in a society that sees itself as rational, reasonable, bureaucratically organized, the mad person represents the deviant. The deviant who is punished. Yeah. What would, what would you say would be the characteristic of contemporary society? Who is the deviant, quote, deviant, who is chased, pursued, and discussed in this society? In this society, Anders? The intolerant. The intolerant. Can you tell me more? Who are the intolerant? Terrorists. Ah. Ah. They kind of follow the government so far. Ah. 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 Interesting. Hannah? (laughs) (laughs) What does President Bush represent? All acts of evil. All acts of evil. (laughs) Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Is that wishful thinking, or is that how you understand that this, the... Wow, yes, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I mean, if you, go, if you go beyond the United States, President Bush does represent evil, right? <laughs> or did represent evil. What is that evil that he represents? What is that evil that he represents when you go outside the United States? Hmm? Interesting, Jason. Uh, American arrogance. Sorry? Amer- American arrogance. American arrogance, yeah. Because... Yeah. Yes, but what is this evil? Is this evil poli- arrogance? Yes, Marianne. Exploitation of power. Exploitation of power. Yeah, but it's you know, when we think of demons, we think of mad people. You know, sometimes delinquents or some sexually deviant people. What is Bush? Sexually deviant? <laughs> 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 yes. Yes. Thus. Isn't it like the opposite? Hmm. Like, he has all the powers, right? Yeah. Ah, yeah. So that's the other way of looking. I mean, that's the other way of saying that. Know. He is the one who's defining who is deviant. And who does he define as deviant? The Middle East. Hmm? What was that? The Middle East. The Middle East. Who's the Middle East? Yeah? The Muslim 
Muslims, well that's one way of looking at Muslims, but I think you were actually, I, mean, I think today the terrorist represents, because we live in an age of what? We live in an age of obsession with security. Everywhere we're obsessed with security, so the terrorist is in a sense the person who expresses that that obsession, that concern with security. Increasingly, we are obsessed with security. Increasingly, in this country and in other countries, we have live in gated communities if we have the possibility of actually gaining access to gated communities. We are concerned all the time with security, security, and therefore the terrorists, in a sense, represent a new era, a new era of obsession with security. One could argue, one could argue, one could argue, yes. I mean, it's interesting, Hannah, that you say that, I mean, from, if you go outside the United States, of course, you know, Bush himself is seen as a what? Almost like a terrorist. Uh-huh. Maybe. Right, yes. Anyway, what actually in many of, um, of, of, of Foucault's works he's concerned with, with sexuality. So what he says is that, you know, when you define somebody as deviant, when you define a man as deviant, then you actually punish the man. Or you imprison the man. Or you lock up the man. Before they locked up lepers, now they lock up the man. And that is an act for Foucault, an act not of building solidarity as it is for Durkheim, enforcing the norms that underpin the collective consciousness, but it's an act of... Papa, power, 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 power. Yes, as we will see. And so when he talks about sexuality, it's very interesting. He has this paradox he presents to us. You know, 19th century Europe was obsessed, he said. Basically, he says, 19th century Europe, sexuality was said in the Victorian era, sexuality was said to be what? Repressed. 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 That's what it was said, right? <laughs> but, he says, at the same time, we spend all our time talking about sexuality. Talking about sexuality. In fact, the idea of repression, formal repression, leads to us talking more and more and more about it. That is the paradox. Supposedly repressed, but in practice, we talk and talk and talk and talk about it. And the circulation of talk, the circulation of discourse, is for him an act of power. We talk about it, and we then sense we define what is normal sex and abnormal sex. And for him, once you define something to be abnormal, it's punished and therefore, you know, it is subject again to repression. Power. Yes? Um, did he actually, like, proclaim himself homosexual? But it seems pretty contradictory to, like, his philosophy that, like, we have these stigmatized categories of, like, that like, have all these, like, like social value of social power. You know what I mean? Like, very, very, very good, Murray. No. He was very ambivalent and ambiguous about his sexual identity. He was very clear what his sexual identity was and what his sexual practices were. But he didn't want to reproduce the very form of domination that he was criticizing by announcing himself as gay. He never made that a political project to announce himself as gay. So absolutely, you got there the paradox, indeed, of Foucault. He did not want to endorse the discourses that would disempower gay people. However, he nevertheless wanted to struggle against those forms of power. In his behavior, he did, but not publicly. To talk about things is already an act of power. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And as we will see, for Foucault, power and knowledge are very closely connected. For Foucault, we will see Durkheimian sociology is a form of knowledge that is, in fact, a form of power. Because Durkheim is obsessed with what? Defining what? Abnormal. And talking about the normal. These very categories, normal and abnormal, are going to be, in Foucault's world, forms of power. Defining what is normal is an act of repression. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. Hmm. 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 Let me just say something else about Foucault. That he was very much embedded in debates in the post-Second World War France. Debates, I've already suggested, against Sartre. Against Sartre's sort of celebrated idea of the intellectual as the conveyor of truth to the people. Foucault was very much more embedded in local struggles, he wanted to be connected to very much, he was very closely connected to the student movements, he was in Tunisia in 1968, May 1968, the French student uprising, but in 1969 it continued and he was there throwing rocks with all the other students, other students, he was no longer, he was already a famous professor in 69, but he was on the on, on, on the picket lines, he was in the, in, in the streets with students he was also, he developed, which is very relevant to this book, he developed an advocacy group for advancing the rights of prisoners, the rights of prisoners and uh, what was called what was it called yeah it's called the information this is very innocent information group on prisons but basically he was interested in investigating the conditions of prisoners and he was very interested in the source of prison rebellions rebellions by prisoners in prisons and this was of course shapes much of what he says in a sense in this book Discipline and Punish which as you'll see is to some extent about prisons yeah yeah so but Foucault had a you know, would argue against Sartre. Sartre, Sartre thought that the individual, an existentialist, thought that the individual had responsibility for his or her acts. And the whole world rested on the individual's 
decisions to behave in certain ways. Every decision was a huge, weighty decision in which the world's future was at stake. And Foucault was very resistant to this idea that somehow freedom had to be expressed through our conscience. He thought this was an act of power. Foucault wanted to emphasize not so much the freedom of individuals to pursue moral choices, but he wanted to emphasize the structures of power that constrain individuals. The structures of power that constrain individuals. Yes. And he was very much opposed, very much opposed to the idea of projecting utopias. Because utopias, like Durkheim's utopia, or Marx's utopia, communism, or this meritocracy, they can come back to haunt one, because they can be used as a form of domination. How was communism used in the Soviet Union? It was used as a form of totalitarian domination. The utopia becomes a norm that is then imposed upon the people. He would not have anything to do with the specification of utopias. In that sense, he refuses to think about utopias, refuses to articulate them. So there's, in a sense, a very pessimistic picture is painted here, but it's a pessimistic picture that will inspire people, and has inspired people, to rebel and to resist, having formulated the structures, the structures and power in which we are enmeshed, so we are inspired to act against them. But not to articulate some new utopia, because that becomes the foundations of new structures of power. So that is where I'm going to end today, but on Tuesday we will start with Damien. Read pages 3 to 31. We will talk about the execution and the timetable. <laughs> I could probably p- figure out how to put it on the website if you want. The pages I read out. The pages I read out. Okay. Question. Are we supposed to buy the product next as a computer capitalism? No, it's in the reader. Okay. It doesn't have a little asterisk. Hmm? It doesn't have a little asterisk. Oh. Doesn't it? The other ones you do, but not for that one. I thought it was just green. Yes. This one doesn't either. Yes, no, that, I know why that doesn't, because I, yeah, I usually order that book. Yes, yeah, so thanks for telling me. No, it's all in the reader. You only need them. Um, this okay. and this. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Oh, well.